Good morning, church. It's nice to see all of you here today. If you're visiting with us, welcome. If you're a regular here, we're glad you're here, and I'm really excited for today. Uh, I want to start out by asking you a question, and here's a question I want to ask you. What are you afraid of? Who here is afraid of spiders? Where's my wife? Raise your hand. She's looking at me, giving me that look. That, that, that's, okay, so that, that's not exactly what I'm talking about. But here's, here is what I'm talking about. What keeps you up at night? What things roll around in here and keeps you from going to sleep at night? What things bog your mind down to the point that you can't think about anything else? What are the things that keep your stomach in knots? The things that make you anxious. The things that make you question. Here's a fact that we all have to deal with. At some point, we are all going to deal with anxiety. Maybe not on the regular, but there's going to be a time in your life and in my life when it's going to show its ugly head. We're all, we're all going to face it. You may have gone 60 years and never really felt anxious, but one day something's going to happen. It might be when you're 15, it might be when you're 25, it might be when you're 50, it might be when you're 75. The bottom line is is at some point, every human being at some point is going to experience anxiety over something. There's a lot of things that can cause that. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. But something happened in, in America in 2012 that changed the landscape for people dealing with fear, anxiety, self-harm, depression. In fact, those four things, fear, anxiety, self-harm, and depression, there was a massive spike in America in 2012 in those four things. Do you have any idea what you think caused that? Anybody? Anybody? While it had been around longer than 2012, 2012 was the year that social media officially wove itself into our lives. And the year that that happened, America saw a massive influx in fear, anxiety, fear, or I said that, depression, self-harm. Again, it had been around longer than that, But that was the year that it, it, maybe this is the right way to say it, that was the year it officially took root in American culture. We are currently living in the most anxious age that humanity's ever seen. In 2023, studies showed that four in 10 adults reported symptoms of anxiety or depression. That's roughly 39.3% of the population. So let's put that into context just for this room, okay? There are roughly 300 people sitting in this room. If four in 10, correct me if my math's wrong. He's my math guru over here. He always helps me with my math because I'm not a math guy. If four in 10 suffer from these symptoms, that means 120 of you sitting in here right now are suffering with fear, Anxiety, depression, self-harm. And it changes because seasons of life change. That means you might be struggling right now, or maybe you're not struggling right now, but maybe you were. And if you weren't and you aren't now, you're going to at some point. But that means 120 people sitting in this room right now are suffering from those things. Some are suffering maybe in a, what we would, not too bad. Maybe, maybe we're just kind of, kind of just dealing with it a little bit, but there are other people in here right now that are 
absolutely feel like they're drowning in anxiety. We're all in a different place. The series that we're in right now, Topical Summer, and and specifically talking about discipleship, this whole month of August, we're talking about what are obstacles to discipleship. And here's one thing that I know to be true, that pastors know to be true, and honestly, Christians know to be true. If you're suffering from anxiety, the likelihood of you producing disciples is slim to none. Because if you're struggling and you're pent up inside and you can't think about something else and it's keeping you up at night and and you've got those, I don't know how you are, but when I get anxious, I get sick on my stomach when I get really anxious. Like it, it messes me up. Like, and it, you can't focus to do the things you need to do because these other things have you so distracted and they have your emotions all out of whack. They have your head all out of whack. So we know that if, if we're going to produce disciples, doing it while we're truly dealing with anxiety or any of these other things is, is hard. The, the reality is the chance of that is slim to none. It cripples our effectiveness when it comes to sharing our faith and making disciples. Louis Giglio is a pastor. He, he's a pastor of Passion, Passion, ugh, Passion City Church in Atlanta. Um, I've been listening to Louis for years and years and years, and I, I greatly respect him and the ministry that he does. This is what he said. You're going to hear me quote him a couple of times today. He wrote a book called Put an X on Anxiety. And I'm going to quote him a couple of times today while I'm talking. And so this is what he has to say about anxiety. Anxiety is a symptom, mostly a symptom of something we are afraid of. But we need to understand that God is in charge of whatever we are afraid of, and he has our back. Folks, I want you to hear that one more time. Anxiety is a symptom, mostly a symptom of something we are afraid of, and we need to understand that God is in charge of whatever we are afraid of, and he has our back. So whatever it is that you're anxious about, or that you get anxious about, or that you were anxious about, or that you are anxious about, God is in control of that. I got this guy in my life, and he often tells me this thing when I tell him, when I talk to him, he often says, you can't worry about what you can't do. You've got to be concerned about what you can do. And guess what? God is in control of the can do, and he's also in control of the can't do. I'm not in control of the can't do, but God is. And God's got my back. The scriptures teach us that God is constantly working his will to the or working the benefit in our lives to the glory of his will. Like we see that throughout scripture. Like he's not making our will of our lives necessarily come to play. He's his will, he's having he's he's having his way and his will in our life in this world. But we get to enjoy the benefits of that. And God is always on our side. He's God is not against us. He is for us. But the question is, when we're suffering from this, what do we do? What do we do when we're struggling with anxiety, fear, depression? We have to find freedom. That's what we have to do. Because you you and I both know that you can't live in that. It will absolutely destroy you if you stay there. You have got to find freedom. And there are certain ways to do that, that we're going to talk about that today. But the, here's the reality. This is something that we know to be true, right? We face a lot of lies in our life. A lot of lies are force-fed to us. Our, our minds try to convince us of things that are untrue. The, you know where that comes to, right? The enemy who's constantly fighting against us is trying to fill us with things that are untrue, that aren't who God is. But here's what we know. We have to constantly replace a lie with the truth to battle those things. In order to escape that, we've got to counteract the lie with the truth. So here's a truth for you to hold on to today. The way to freedom is not a how, it's a who. The way to freedom is not a how, it's a who. And that's directly from Louis Giglio. I'm quoting him and sharing that from him because it's so true. There is not... Well, there are a lot of things that we can do, right? And we have a lot of people who are telling us what we can do to to get help and and to move forward and and to be able to defeat things. Ultimately, the solution is not a how. It's a who, it's a person. 
And that's where we find true freedom. So today we're going to look at two passages of Scripture I think are key in this very thing. And so if you'll open up, if you have a copy of God's Word, I'm going to ask you to open up to Psalm 23 with me today. I know that it hasn't been too awful long since Pastor Hilton walked us through this psalm, but I wanted, I felt it was very appropriate for us to go back there because look, a lot of times, the majority of time we hear this particular psalm is when? Funerals, death. But as we learn in that series that Pastor Hilton took us through, there's so much life to be found in this psalm. So let's look at it. Psalm 23, we're going to read it together. I'm going to ask you if you would, if if you're able, would you stand as we read this together? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, we are so thankful for the truth of your word. God, thank you for giving us this so that we can know you, know who you are, know who you want to be in our life. God, if there's ever a question or an answer to be found to a question, God, this is where to find it. So Lord, help us to listen closely today to what, not what I have to say, but God, but what your word says. Lord, we love you. Walk us through this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So here's the first thing I want you to get today. Freedom is found in the who? The Lord, my shepherd, Jesus. We said that true for the way to freedom is not a how, it's a who. And therefore, freedom is found in the who? The Lord, my shepherd, Jesus. Now, like I said a minute ago, what I don't want you to hear me say is that if you're struggling with these things, is that there aren't things that you can be doing proactively to get help. So let me say this abundantly clear, because again, I don't want you to misconstrue anything I'm saying. I believe in doctors. I believe in therapists. I believe in medicine. um, I believe in all those things because I believe God has given those people knowledge, experience, things to help us. Look, sometimes Truly, it's like a body chemical imbalance, right? And without medicine, you can't fix that chemical imbalance. I believe in all those things. So what I don't want you to say, think, is walk out of here thinking that Adam doesn't believe in doctors, he doesn't believe in medicine, he doesn't believe in therapy, doesn't believe, no, I absolutely do. But I believe that the end all be all is Jesus. That's what I believe. I believe that my shepherd is the only one who can truly heal my heart. I believe if you're struggling, you should go talk to your doctor or your counselor. But you know who else I think you should talk to? A pastor or a trusted friend who's been walking in their faith for a long time. Because these two things are meant to go hand in hand and work together, not against each other. What the how can't be for you, the how can't be your good shepherd. Only Jesus can do that. You see, doctors can't restore your soul. They can't help you fear no evil. They're not going to lead you beside quiet waters. They don't have a rod and a staff staff that's going to protect you. They're not going to, they're especially not going to prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Only Jesus can do that. There is, I I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again because I think it's so important. There is is a deep-seated space that only belongs to God, that no one else can fill. When I am not, I'll just be really transparent. There are times in my life where things happen, and I, I get out of my routine of my quiet times and my regular prayer times. Look, we all go through that, right? I'm not afraid to tell you that there are times where I struggle, okay? 
Just because I'm up here and Pastor Hilton's up here and Josh is up here and whoever else is up here doesn't mean that we don't ever struggle just like you do. And when I get in those times where I'm, I'm out of those quiet times and out of my prayer time like I normally am, I can feel it deep within my soul. I start longing for that thing that's missing. I start longing for that time. I start longing for feeling God's presence. It's not that he walked away or left, but something got me distracted. And instead of being in tune with God and being where I need to be, instead what's happened is I've stepped over here and now I have this this emptiness that there's no amount of medicine, there's no amount of therapist, there's no amount of friends, there's no amount of anything other than Jesus that's going to be able to fill that. So for you, when you're struggling through this, should you do those other things? Should you get help? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, are you walking with Jesus and are you giving it to him? Here's one thing I've noticed in our current culture, cultural climate that that I've seen with, with Christians. We tend to ask everybody in the world to pray for us. We'll even put it on Facebook, pray for me. Put it on Instagram, pray for me. Put it on TikTok, pray for me. But did you pray about it? You asked everybody else to. But did you stop long enough to pray about it? And when you tell somebody you're going to pray for them, do you, do you legitimately pray for them or do you forget about it and then you realize like a week later that you never prayed for that person you said you were going to pray for? One thing I've tried really hard to do in my life, and I know, again, I know I've shared this before. In fact, it just happened this morning. Somebody came to me and my wife and said, can you please pray for this person? We listened to what was going on. I'm going to continue praying for that person, but you know what I didn't want to do? I didn't want to tell them that I was going to pray for them, and then, God forbid, something happened. I didn't. So we stopped right there, and we prayed for that person right then and there. It's that important. That's, that's, that's what we need. Because nobody else can do what God can do. In fact, I want to, I want to do something and I want to read Psalm 23 to you, but I want to change one word, one title. Y'all don't get ready to throw me under the bus. You'll see what I'm doing in just a second. And I just want you to listen to it this way, okay? The Lord is Adam's shepherd, and I shall not want. Jesus makes me lie down in green pastures. Jesus leads me beside quiet waters. Jesus restores my soul. Jesus guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, Adam, will fear no evil because Jesus is with me. Jesus, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jesus, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Jesus, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love and kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Folks, do you hear how personal that is when you do that? That is how personal this is meant for you. In fact, I would challenge you to do this. I would challenge you to write out that song and insert your name and insert me and insert the name of Jesus and all those places and post it in your house, in your car, everywhere that you look as a constant reminder to you that Jesus, he is your shepherd. He is with you. He is for you. He has great plans for you. He wants to do this. He wants to walk with you beside quiet waters. He wants to lie down, help you lie down in green pastures. He wants to restore your soul. It's all these things that he wants to do. But do you know who stands in the way of those things happening? I stand in the way of me. And you stand in the way of you. And then you let other people stand in the way of you. 
But at the end of the day, the only person that you can blame for standing in the way of allowing these things to happen is yourself. You can blame other people all you want. But it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's your life. It's your walk with Jesus. It's your anxiety. It's your frustrations. It's your depression. It's those things. And again, you need a, coll- a collective community around you to help you in this time. But at the end of the day, your walk with Jesus your willingness to trust Jesus will be the rock-solid foundation you need to climb out of that pit. And it will be not only the foundation you need, but it will be every step on the ladder because even, if, even in getting help from the other things, Jesus will line up the help you need. That's how he works. God will line up exactly what you need. Flip over to Matthew chapter 6. And I want us to read another passage of Scripture. I'm not going to have you stand this time. Um, but we're going to read Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. And, and I know for any of you that's been around the kingdom for many amount of time, this is going to be a pretty familiar passage. But I don't know how we couldn't talk about this today and not talk about this passage because it is so blatantly clear. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, this is what it says. For this reason... I say to you, now remember, this is Jesus talking, okay? These are his words. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying what we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear for clothing. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you so do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will care for itself each day has enough trouble of its own folks here's the cure for anxiety seek jesus the cure for anxiety seek jesus seek jesus do you did you hear what the last part did you hear what the last part of that says Uh, verse 33, here's what he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I didn't say that, Jesus did. One of the worst things that happens to us up here when we're struggling with anxiety, we tend to feel like we're all alone. Nobody understands. The enemy is great. Man, when we get to this point, this is where he sets in. He's like, you know what? You're exactly right. You are all alone. Nobody else understands. Even though you've got a friend who went through this five years ago, nobody understands. Even though people up there have been testifying about God's goodness through that exact situation, nobody understands. What do we know about the enemy? In John 10, 10, Jesus says this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He will use anyone and everyone that he can in every situation possible to steal, kill, and destroy from your life. And his biggest thing is he will use the enemy and people and stuff and situations to steal you away from Jesus. Now, I don't believe in you can lose your salvation. That's not what I mean. What I'm saying is, remember I was talking about earlier about like when you are walking with Jesus and something happens, you get distracted and you stop spending that time. That's what I'm talking about. He will do anything he can to put space between you and Jesus so that you lose focus and all of a sudden you feel alone. You feel like God's not there. You feel like you have no presence there. You feel like when you pray, you hit a ceiling. You feel like when all this stuff's happening, he will do whatever he can to make you feel like there's a separation between you and God he'll convince you that you're alone. And all of a sudden, your finite mind will say, he's right. I'm by myself. I don't have anybody. I can't trust anybody. I can't talk to anybody. There's no, no hope for me. But folks, 
Listen to the second half of John 10.10. After he just talked about what the enemy's coming to do, he says, I came, talking about Jesus, I came so that you would have life and have it abundantly. Look, he didn't say the thief's coming to steal, kill, and destroy, and there's no hope. He said, no, the thief is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, and I'm coming to tell you, I am your hope. I come because I want to give you one scripture translation. I love the way it says it. It says, I come to give you life and give it to the full. He wants us to have the fullest life we could possibly have. But the enemy wants just the opposite. And he will work and he will fight. And, and some of y'all, some of us, we live sometimes like there ain't, we don't have an enemy in the world. And we think, man, I don't have any bad feelings going on with anybody right now. No, you've lost your focus because let me tell you, there is an enemy who is out to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Even when you think everything's great with everybody around you, there is an enemy lurking in the shadows, ready and waiting to take you down. But there's a Savior who's not in the shadows, he's in the light, who says, I've come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. Jesus is in the process of taking care of everything. But what does he say our responsibility is? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That means, here's what that means. You should be seeking Jesus over everything, everyone, everything and everyone else in your life. And then everything that, fl- that happens in your life from there is an overflow of your walk with Jesus. That's what that means. That means nothing should come before our relationship with Jesus. Nothing should become before our, the mission of Jesus and what we're supposed to be doing as believers. And, and specifically in this series, talk about one of the key things that Jesus taught us that we're to make disciples. That means that one of our, our very first priorities in life should be making disciples. But we, we got to figure out how to deal with all of this stuff. So how do we deal with that stuff? We seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You know when the best time to pray is? We don't feel like it. It's real easy to pray when things feel good. A lot harder to pray when things aren't so good. You know where the best time to spend with Jesus is? All the time you can. Or first thing in the day before anything else happens. Remember I was talking on charity about what happened in 2012 with social media. Let me ask you this question. For those of you on social media including me. What if, what if you swap, what for one week, what would happen to your life if you, every time you went to go on social media, you went to the Bible and said, for one week? What if you got rid of all social media on your phone and every time you went to pick it up, instead of going into Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, whatever, you opened the Bible app. And you went through a devotional and you read scripture. What if every time you turned your radio on during that particular week, you didn't turn it on anything but The Journey, Air One, Caleb, Spirit FM? What if for one week, everything that we did, what if we turned the tables upside down? What would happen in our life? I wonder what would happen up here. If we did that, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I just want to take just a minute, I want to read you several scriptures, things that you could be replacing the lie with the truth, and things you could be turning the tables with. These are just some ideas of some scriptures you could go to. Philippians 4, 6-7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 6-7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Psalm 55.22, Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. 
Hebrews 13, 6. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Isaiah 41, 10. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Folks, his word is full of truth time and time and time again to replace the lie so that you know that you are not alone and you have a place, not just a place, you have a person to cast all your anxiety on. Jesus is ready and waiting for you to cast your anxiety on him. Ten years ago, my family went through an extremely traumatic situation. Um, easily the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. And we didn't know where to turn. We didn't, some of you guys know our story. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details today, but we didn't know what to do. And a friend of mine said, hey, I've got somebody I want you to talk to. So we reached out to this guy and we went to talk to him and we began meeting with him regularly. And, and every single time we met with him, do you know what he constantly did? He gave us things that would help us. But he kept pointing us back to Jesus. He would give us things to help us through what we were going through. But every single time, even in the midst of those real things we could be doing, he constantly pointed us back to Jesus. The reason I tell you that is because that I had never truly suffered from anxiety until that situation happened 10 years ago. And I have been on this roller coaster for 10 years. Some days I'm fine. Other days I'm not so fine. Most of the time I'm pretty good about hiding it, but I know what I'm dealing with inside. Four years ago, COVID pandemic struck. Everything we knew changed. The way we do our jobs changed, our kids even getting to go to school, getting to meet as a church. All of a sudden, that, that roller coaster that I'd been on for six years just went to like the steepest incline I've, I've experienced in a long time because what are we supposed to do? Like, what does that look like? How does, and so we started doing everything we could try to figure out what to do. And then a couple years later, I began to experience tragedy amongst friends. And we began trying to help people walk through that. And, and then as a pastor and, and as, as them being my friends, I began to push down my stuff to help other people deal with their stuff. And then last year, just before... You all granted me that gift of a sabbatical. It, the depression, for the first time in my life, depression set in. And I'll just be completely transparent. I was ready to walk away from, it had nothing to do with you. It was all me. I was ready to walk away from the church. I was ready to walk away from ministry. It had just become such a weight. And I was in such a bad place. That I just did not know what to do. Thank God, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine had pointed me to the same person I was talking about earlier, the can-do versus the can't-do. He's a counselor for pastors, and I meet with him at minimum four times a year. If I need more, for a long time, I met with him every week. I mean, that was probably a year, and then the next year was like every three weeks. Um, now, now it's just kind of like preventative maintenance once a quarter, kind of like you get your oil changed in your car, you know? Um, but last year something in me finally broke. And I didn't know how I was going to come back after that sabbatical. I can tell you this. That was one of, the, one of the greatest gifts of my life. You have no idea the healing that did in me that month, last year. And I still have a long ways to go, and I still have a lot of things to figure out. But because of all these people, I had gone and got help. I went to my doctor who is a friend and he's a Christian and I went to my, he's my PCP. I went to him and I said, I need some help. I went to my counselor and I said, I need some help. I went to my friends finally and said, I need some help. Um, 
But do you know what all these people continue to do? They continue to point me back to Jesus. Because at the end of the day, while I needed to do all of these things and get this help that I was getting, I needed to be reminded that no matter what, Jesus was the ultimate answer. He was the ultimate cure for what I was going through. He was the only person that was really going to fix me. And folks, I'm telling you, he's the only person that's going to fix you too. So lastly, let me say this to you. As he sets me free from the anxiety in my own life, he sets me free from the anxiety of telling others about him. Because what happens is when you're, you're anxious about things, you become anxious about telling people about Jesus. You worry about what they're gonna, how they're going to respond. You worry about them telling you no. You worry about all these other things that you can't control. It's not your responsibility for how someone responds to the gospel. When I'm done here today, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to the gospel. But here's what I can't do. I can't force Jesus into your life as much as I wish I could. It's up to you what you do with Jesus. All I can do is let the anxiety go of telling you about Jesus and trust him with the results. Because that's the can't do part. But he wants to set you free. Look, I'm not saying that he's going to set you free and you're never going to struggle with it again because that'd be a lie. Because stuff happens. People are fallible. Life is full of sin. There's all kinds of stuff. And you're going to have these roller coasters of emotions and, and life seasons are going to go up and down. But I can tell you this, that as Jesus sets you free and it will become a constant process of Jesus setting you free from these things, he will begin to set you free from and give you the freedom to share Jesus. And look, I'm... I don't stand up here and tell you my story for no reason. Here's why I tell you my story of what's happened to me. Because if I can't be transparent with you, why am I, how could I ever ask you to be transparent with anybody else? Folks, this should be the place, this building, everything you're looking at right now, the people sitting in this room, these are be the people we should be able to be real with. Because when we go out there, we need to be reminded that we've got people on our side when we go through this stuff, when we're sharing Jesus with people. This should be the safe place that we can get down on our knees, that we can be transparent, we can say, I'm struggling. I'm so sick and tired of churches being places where people feel like they go in, they got to put a happy face on and bring like their whole life is great when it's falling apart. I hear that from people all the time. This should be a place where you and I can be real. And as Jesus has set me free, it makes me more passionate about telling other people about him because I want them to be set free too. I don't want people to struggle without Jesus. I can't imagine struggling through some of the things I've struggled with without Jesus. I can't even fathom it. Not just because of my personal walk with him, but because of the people that he's brought into my life and have walked with me through these seasons. Folks, there's something to the way Jesus lived his life. He preached to the thousands. He changed the world with the twelve, but then he had the three of his inner circle. There's something about how he brings community together and he brings people in your circle. That's what he's done for us and for me. And that's what he'll do for you. And he'll set you free. And he'll use those people over and over and over again to help continually set you free. But you've got to get out of the way. See, Jesus, he's our shepherd. He's, he's my shepherd. And he wants to be your shepherd. And 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 he wants to walk you beside quiet waters. And walk you beside quiet waters. And walk you beside quiet waters. And walk you beside quiet waters. He wants to restore your soul. And 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 your soul. His rod and his staff is there to protect you, and 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 protect you. And he's ready and willing to do those things right now.
question is, what are you going to do? You see, Jesus isn't going to he isn't going to force himself on you. He will tell you he is ready and waiting. His Holy Spirit will work on you. He will convict you. He will bring you to a place where you know that he's calling. Some of y'all are sitting right there, right there right now, and you know that he's calling out to you right now. You know it. You can feel it. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the power of his Holy Spirit. And you needed to be here today to hear these words out of his word, not from my mouth. You needed to hear truth. You needed a lie to be replaced with truth. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I want you to do me a favor. Just put your Bibles, books, notepads, phones, all that stuff away. And I just want you, just for a second, nobody move when I do this. Even band, don't move yet. I just want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I simply want you to do this. Ask God, God, what are you saying to me right now? And I want to read these words over you right now. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. He makes you lie down in green pastures. He leads you beside quiet waters. He restores your soul. He guides you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear any evil because he is with you. His rod and his staff they comfort you. He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He has anointed your head with oil and your cup overflows. Surely goodness and love and kindness will follow you all the days of your life and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, I pray right now in the quietness of this moment, Lord, I pray that you would have your will and your way in this place. God, there are people right now who are going through a season where they feel like they're in the valley of the shadow of death. There are people right now who desperately need to feel your presence. Lord, they feel your presence, but they desperately need a touch from you today. God, I ask that in the quietness of this place that no one in this building will be fearful of saying, God, I need you. And so, Lord, whatever, whatever need there is, God, I pray that people would know you. Lord, maybe today, maybe for the first time, somebody needs to know you personally as their Savior. And so, Jesus, I pray right now that, Lord, if there's any person in this room, on our stream, within the sound of my voice, who needs to have a relationship with you because they can't know you as a shepherd until you change their life, God, I pray they would know that it, it's unbelievably simple to have a relationship with you. Your word says that we have to confess in our heart. Lord, and confessing means we know that we are sinners and we've messed up. And we confess and that we know that you're the only solution. And Lord, that we believe in our heart that you rose from the grave. You died and that you rose three days later. God, that we'll be saved. So if there's anyone in here today and you need to know Jesus, I just want to invite you to pray. I want to invite you to pray and I can't, again, I can't, Make Jesus come into your life. 
but I do want to tell you that he's ready and waiting to enter into your heart. So if that's, what you, if that's you today, I would invite you to pray something like this. You've got to pray. I can't pray for you. Lord, I need you right now. And I know I'm a sinner. And I know I've messed up. And God, I just ask that today that you would come into my life, clean me up, make me whole, change my life, and walk with me forever. I trust you with my entire life, my entire being. I love you. With nobody looking around, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I do want to do this. I want to offer as one of your pastors to pray for you. And so if that's you, if that was your decision, if you've made that decision today, would you just slip your hand up? Nobody's looking around. I'm the only person looking. I just want to be able to pray for you. That's all I want to do. I see you back there. I got you. I see 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 you. I got you. I see you. Amen. I see you. The scriptures say that on days like today that angels are rejoicing. And I want you to know that we rejoice with you. And I want you to know that I'm going to pray for you. And as a church, we want to help you take your next steps. In fact, the next two weeks are baptism services, and we'd love to see you make your faith public. We'd be happy to talk to you about that. Find one of us after the service. Come talk to us. And I want to talk to everybody else in here. We just saw a good portion of people just give their lives to Jesus. What about everybody else who knows Jesus? Maybe it's time you say, Jesus, I need your help right now. I feel like I have been feeling like I've been all alone. And I don't want to feel alone anymore. I want to pray for you. But then here's what I'm going to do. After I pray, I'm going to ask you, to do something. I'm going to ask ask the band to head on up here. And After I pray, what I want to do is I want to invite you. I I don't want you to wait. I want you to get on your face. I want you to get on your knees. I want you to come up here. I want you to get down on your hands and knees at this altar. You can do it at your seat. But I want, there is something about surrender right here in this space that's different. It's that posture. And I want to invite you to come down here and I want to invite you to get on your hands and knees. Maybe you're doing great right now, but maybe you know somebody who's struggling. Or maybe, maybe, maybe you want to pray and ask God to help you. Maybe things are great right now, but maybe you want to ask God to help you as you prepare for what's coming next. Or maybe you're just drowning and you just need some people to huddle around you. I want to encourage you, if you see people up here, I want to encourage you to come up here and, and pray. Get on your knees and put your arms around them and pray for them. So, Father, I pray for this group of people who know you and know Jesus. God, help us. Help us to God to cry out to you. God, whether things are, we're drowning right now or whether maybe we're just teetering with some of this or God, maybe, maybe things are great and we just want to say, God, help me continue to build that foundation so that God, when times come, God, I won't sway from what I know to be true. So God, just remind them today that you love them. I pray you'd fill them up. God, I pray that we would trust you. God, thank you again for the people who've given their life to you today. God, that is, their lives have just been changed. Things will never be the same again. God, I'm so excited about what you're doing because God, I know now they, ha- they can have real hope for their life. They, 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 it's not that they can, they do have real hope for their life. So Jesus, thank you for that. Thank you for being true to your word time and time again. God, thank you for loving us the way you do. 
And we pray in Jesus' good name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me? Folks, I want to challenge you. First of all, God has been doing some incredible work. We've got a, a, a number of some new brothers and sisters in here today. But God's not done. And I want to invite you to come down here and get on your hands and knees. We'll have people down here. I'm going to ask our deacons if they'll come down. Pastor Hilton, if you'll come down. Josh, maybe if you would come down. Um, some of our ladies has been in their faith for a while. Maybe you would come down and join them. So we'll have some ladies down here. Look, I want you to know, you don't have to be afraid. This is a safe place. We're here for you. We love you. When you leave today, if you didn't grab one when you came in, we made up these little cards. They're at the tables. They're at the entrances and exits. But it's just a list of some scriptures to give you hope that you can just put somewhere that you can. It's just a quick go to. It's not a lot, but it's some for you just to be able to stick in in places to remind you, this is where I can go where I need hope. And so when you leave today, pick up one of these because you never know. It may be years before it shows back up in your life. I don't know. I hope it will be a daily reminder, but I, you never know how God will use something small. So I want to invite you now, though, to come get on your knees, get on your face. Let some people gather around you that can lift you up and remind you that God loves you and that he's with you and that he's for you. You come when you're ready.